at University of Southern California, Los Angeles, USA. He completed his PhD from NIT Delhi. During his PhD, he worked as a visiting researcher at NCTU Taiwan, IIT Bombay. He has published several articles in reputed journals. His research interests include dynamic spectrum access, reinforcement learning for cognitive radio and IoT networks. Thank you, sir. Now I am requesting to Rohit sir, sir, please share your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akanksha, uh, for a wonderful introduction. And thank you so much, uh, the organizing team, for uh, giving me opportunity to talk about uh, my uh, topic that is reinforcement learning in wireless networks. So I hope my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So in next one, one and a half hours, uh, I will be talking about the reinforcement learning in wireless networks, right? So as the topic of the this faculty development program is uh, wireless sensor networks and the IOTs. So I will be including both of them in this uh, talk. And specifically, I will be uh, telling that how reinforcement learning algorithms can be used for both uh, net uh, type of networks, that is wireless networks, including uh, IOT networks as well, right? So, uh, uh, my outline of my talk is going to be, I will start with a brief introduction of the reinforcement learning and going towards the multi-arm bandit algorithm, which I will be using uh, throughout uh, this work. And then uh, I will be talking about two types of networks, that is cognitive radio networks, which is one of the wireless networks. So I will be telling how evolution uh, cognitive radio was evolved and then how reinforcement learning helps in that. And then I will be talking about some hardware testbed which we have created and then reinforcement learning IoT networks that how the same uh, kind of algorithms can also be used for the IoT networks. And then I will conclude and have some discuss some open research problems. So I will start uh, by thanking to my all the collaborators, uh, Professor Bhaskar Krishnamachari at University of Southern California, Professor Ajay K. Sharma, who is now uh, director in IIT Delhi, Dr. Sumit Darak uh, from Triple IIT Delhi, Dr. Manjesh Hanawal, IIT uh, Bombay, Dr. Rajiv Tripathi and IIT Delhi. Unfortunately, he is no more with us. And Professor Y.C. Kwan at NCTU Taiwan. So... I will be starting with a brief introduction of reinforcement learning. What exactly this is? So, basically, reinforcement learning is a subset of machine learning. Machine learning can broadly be divided into three parts. That is unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So, I will typically be talking about the reinforcement learning. So, what is that? So, I will start with a very basic definition of reinforcement learning which says that it is a learning what to do how to map situations to actions so as to maximize the numerical reward signal the learner is not told which actions to take but instead must discover which actions yield the most reward by trying them i know that just looking at this definition it is not uh, easy to digest it so for better understanding i will start with a very small example of it Let's take an example of a newly born baby, newly born child. Well, a child is born, he or she does not know how to walk. So he uses an error and trial method. Or I can say trial and error method. What does it mean? Initially, he wants to scroll, he wants to stand up, he falls down, Again, he learns from that. Again, he falls down and the process continues. And finally, he's know, he knows that how to walk. Means initially, he does not have any information. But with learning, he exactly knows how to walk. The same thing can be correlated over here. It says that is learning what to do, how to map situations to actions so as to maximize a numerical reward signal. In that example, what is the reward? Reward is how to walk. The learner is not told which actions to take, but instead must discover which actions. Means the uh, newly born baby is not told which actions to take. 
just by saying his mother that you have to walk like this he cannot but he will try do some error and then again the same approach works over here so in the reinforcement learning setting there is always an environment an agent agent takes some action to the environment he gets some observation and based upon that he applies some policy and some reinforcement learning algorithm and the final goal is to train an agent to complete a task with an unknown environment right the agents receives observations and reward from the environment and send actions to environment so basically i will start a application of reinforcement learning in this multi arm bandit framework what exactly is this you can see multiple machines over here and basically this machine is a photograph taken from a casino casino is a place where gambler goes with some input money and tries to maximize the reward now let's try to understand how it is related with the reinforcement learning let's say a gambler enters into the casino and he sees there are five inst machines installed like this over there now the rule of game is like this that you have a ins to insert one rupee coin and in reward you will get some reward then he will try once the let's say first machine and he gets reward 50 rupees let's say it means he will be it is very possible that he will be happy that okay against one rupees i have earned 50 rupees and then again he will try the first machine and this time he has to give the penalty of rupees 1000 rupees and this is a kind of rule that has been set up that you can also have to give the penalty right so in that case he will gap, have to give penalty and then he will conclude oh my god the first machine is not good so he will go for the second machine let's the second machine give 1000 rupees in first try again he will try it will get 10000 rupees and let's say uh, again he goes for the third try and get, gives a penalty of 5000 rupees again he will say oh that again that's a bad choice so what i am trying to see say, uh, say that unless and until he does not have a good idea of all those four must five machines their characteristics of those machines he cannot say with certain guarantee that okay this is the good machine because and once he have sufficient observations about all those machines then with certain guarantee he can say that okay this is the best machine and thereafter once he is confirmed with certain probability then he will say okay this is the best machine and now every time he will be selecting the same machine so how this uh, reinforcement learning approach works over here initially as i that it does not have any idea it works right so uh, this is the same thing i have written that the objective of the gambler is to maximize the collected reward through iterative pulls and the exploration and exploitation trade off this is the most important factor that unless and until you don't sufficiently explore all the machines you cannot exploit it so and but it's also true that all the machines that should be ex sufficiently explored in addition you should not always keep exploring otherwise when will you exploit it once you know with certain guarantee that okay this is the best machine then obviously you will start exploiting it so that is why this exploration and exploitation trade off is required so reward what reward vector we assume is the let's say it denote the machines selected at a time t whenever it selects some machine it gets a reward and there is a term associated in re uh, with reinforcement learning that is called regret and what is that regret is that the difference between the ideal situation and the practical situation t into p vec a star indicates p vec a star indicates basically that okay if that probability was already known to the user then obviously he could have selected every time the best machine but minus what actually he is doing so this difference gives us the regret 
And the final goal is that expected rig rate should be as minimum as possible, right? So now I have given you some idea of what exactly reinforcement learning is and what exactly multi-amp bandit framework is. Now I will start some basic introduction about the cognitive radio networks and then I will merge all three of the, these basic concepts and show you that how this multi arm bandit or reinforcement learning approach can be used in cognitive radio networks. So I am starting with this diagram. This talks typically about an analog or distal multi standard radio, which was not programmable or upgradable, and it was having some limited operating frequency rates initially. You can see that. Initially, there are separate RF front end, IF front end, ADC, and there's digital IF front end and DSP for each. So let's say a, in old days mobiles, there were if there was a Bluetooth facility available in one mobile, or uh, there was no radio in one mobile, then if you wanted to change, there is no facility that you can change that. You have to change entirely the mobile only. So for all kind of prototypes, including Bluetooth, including Wi-Fi, including radios, you had to have different RF front end, front IF front end, ADC, digital IF print, and ESP. Later on, we came to DSP, uh, uh, that is software defined radio. What happened there? That in software defined, defined radios, we made this digital IF front end and digital signal processing reconfigurable. So now we can reconfigure it using the software, right? And when we move to software uh, cognitive radio, then we added some intelligence in that. What does that intelligence means? You can see a word decision making. And what does decision making means? It will make some decision using its own intelligence, right? So this is how this cognitive radio comes. So let's talk about a basic uh, definition of this cognitive radio. It says that it's built on a software defined radio is an intelligent wireless communication system that is aware and adapt to a statistical variations of its environment with three primary objectives. So let's understand something about cognitive radio. What's the final goal of this science? So that will be more clear with this diagram. What this diagram talks about that we all, all already have a large spectrum crisis, right? You know that we have the spectrum is too costly. And in that case, still we can easily see using in this diagram that there are certain frequency range which are not being used even 50% of the time. Means we can say that yes, it's totally a vestige of the band. So what should we do? So there the concept of cognitive radio comes into the picture and says that, okay, no problem. That frequency range is not being used, uh, used. So being cognitive radio users or secondary users, what I will do, I will use that spectrum with the condition that who has purchased that spectrum those are called primary users. If they come into, uh, they want to use it, I will have to go away from them, right? So this is the concept given in this diagram. That you can see there are two types of users, uh, users that is primary user and secondary user. Primary user are the licensed users who have purchased the license for that particular spectrum. Whereas secondary users are not the licensed one so they have to use it as the secondary users are only said as cognitive radio users. So the secondary users have to use this spectrum intelligently using some kind of intelligence. What does it mean? That firstly it will sense that okay, that particular spectrum is free. When it is free, now is there any way firstly to make it guaranteed that, okay, this spectrum is free, we have to apply some kind of a spectrum sensing techniques. Based upon that, I will say, okay, yes, this spectrum is free. Then I would like to use that spectrum. So that is called opportunistic spectrum access 
this technique is being used. It is also called dynamic spectrum access. This technique is being used by the secondary users or called cognitive radio users to access the spectrum opportunistically. And what makes sure that if being a secondary user, I'm using that spectrum. This is my sole responsibility to get, get away from that space or a spectrum if a primary users come into that place. So this is the primary concept of primary user, secondary user and opportunistic spectrum access. Now I have used another term that is called decentralized slotted cognitive radio networks. So there are two types of cognitive radio networks. One is uh, centralized and another is decentralized. This centralized radio network concept says that, okay, there are, let's say, five secondary users and who are trying to access the same spectrum. Then they will not take their decision of their own. Rather than there will be a centralized coordinator or controller who will decide which cognitive radio user should be given the access to that particular spectrum. Whereas in decentralized, and in fact, it is a more practical assumption that it should be decentralized. So where all the secondary users will have their own observations and based upon their own observations, they have to take the decision and access the spectrum. So that is how it will work. So the data transmission outcome is binary means either if he tries to transmit, either he will successfully do it or it will get a failure. So this is how this opportunistic spectrum access in decentralized network works. You can see a base station and in green color, you can see the primary users. They are directly linked to the base station, means they can have the access to the base station directly. Whereas there are CRs, you can see there, who does not have access to the base station. So the purpose is this CR mode is cognitive radio mode. They have to identify optimum vacancy frequency band of any desired bandwidth. Right. So the ultimate goal is that we have to do opportunistic spectrum access in single secondary user pair decentralized network. And how to do the, uh, we transmit in that? You can see TS is band selection. So if there is a, let's say, a duration of a time slot is T, then initial TS time slot, it will be dedicating for band selection. Means it will be selecting a free particular frequency band. Thereafter, it will sense it for some time. And when it sends, means it will sense whether there is any primary user or not. If there is no primary user, it's good. In that case, it will t uh, transmit in that T trans time slot. And if it transmits, then at TF time slot, it will get feedback whether that transmission has been successful or not. So you can see now we have replaced that this decision making with this one that uh, how this cognitive radio users can make the decision for the opportunistic spectrum access. So now the final I am defining this term that to learn that the now what is the problem over here that the spectrum vacancy statistics is obviously not known to the users because you know it very well that how will a second user know that whether a particular spectrum band is free or not. For that, he has to apply some kind of learning. And that is why I have written over here to learn the spectrum occupancy probability and thus to exploit the optimal bands we use reinforcement learning. So here, now I conclude all my three top, uh, terms which I had have used till now, that is starting from reinforcement learning. How did we go to the multi arm bandit? And then how do we go to the cognitive radio networks? So now from here, the research problem starts. What is that? That in a network, there may be several secondary users. There may be several cognitive radio users who are looking for some unoccupied spectrum. Then how will he know that how many users are there in the network other than me? If I anyhow, using some logic, using some intelligence, 
I know that, okay, I am the only user, then I will be happier still. Yes, and I will be using the best channel, best spectrum band always. But if there are certain users other than me, then there is high probability you will have to understand over here that if more than one secondary user are looking for the same part of a spectrum, then what will happen? If they all transmit on the same part of the spectrum, they will collide. There will be collision and resultantly no one will be able to transmit its data successfully. So that is why the, no, knowing the number of active secondary users in the network is very important. And what happens that up to uh, some time ago, the researchers assume to know, assume that we already have that number of academic uh, active secondary users known in advance, which was not a very practical assumption. So I used our research said that, okay, we will estimate that. Number two, in, incur a significant number of secondary users collision leading to, so obviously, as I said, when more than one secondary user will be transmitting, large number of collisions will be there. And thus it will lead to inefficient use of battery, power, spectrum, time, ability. And thus, as a result, the throughput of the network will also be very poor. So now from here, we can go for the objectives of the network. That we have to develop some distributed algorithms for opportunistic spectrum in the cognitive radio networks, having higher spectrum utilization with minimum number of collisions. So, now we need to understand that how can we do that? How should we approach for it? So now let's formulate the problem. Number one, we are not aware of the frequency spectrum characteristics that with which probability the spectrum is free or occupied. So number one problem is that we have to learn that statistics. Number two, we have to estimate the number of secondary users. And then number three is that we have to exploit the best channels. And when I say best channels, what does it mean? That the channel having the highest probability of vacancy. And what does probability of vacancy mean? That the probability that there is no primary user because you can transmit only when there is no primary user. So the problem becomes threefold. Number one, to estimate the channel statistics. Number two, to estimate the number of secondary users other than me in the network. Number three, to exploit the best channels. With And finally, goal will be to the higher spectrum utilization and the lower number of collisions. So this is how I have mentioned as a first objective that we have to develop this distributed algorithm having higher spectrum utilization and with minimum number of collisions. Second, to realize USRP best test bed validation for because uh, what's the concept behind this? Let's try to understand that. Okay, we have designed an algorithm, no problem. But firstly, we need to check that is it theoretically fine? Is it mathematically fine? So we need to give a theoretical proof for that. So. Our objective was to perform the theoretical analysis of the proposed algorithm. Third, okay, I have proposed the algorithm as well. It's mathematically and theoretical sound as well, but is it going to be applied really in the real radio environment? So we have to validate it using the hardware uh, setup. So for that, we had proposed this universal software radio peripheral based test bed for validation of those algorithms. So these are our objectives. These are our objectives. So let's start with the network model that I had assumed. It's very simple that there are U secondary U number of secondary users. So let's understand that secondary user and cognitive radio users, they are being used interchangeably, right? So there are huge secondary users and N uniform bandwidth channels. N channels are there. Then time slotted communication is used. That is time horizon is divided into T time slots of index 1 to T. And where in each time slot, 
initially we do some primary user sensing and if i don't find any primary user over there then i will do the transmission else i won't transmit in that time slot and probability of vacancy of the ith channel is mu i has that is it has iid distribution across time slots means independently identically independently distributed what does it mean that means a channel is either free or occupied that is zero or one that's all there is no third option <laughs> whereas <coughs> here only it uh, worth mentioning that what can be the other model other model can be like this uh, that is called a markovian distribution what does this markovian distribution mean that in that case there are four possibilities of that probability that okay right now a channel is free what will it be occupied in that time slot or it will be free in that time slot so there are two probability probability of vacancy to probability of occupied and or probability of vacancy to probability of vacancy and similarly there will be four so right now what kind of setup i had assumed is that iid distribution so now coming to the algorithm part right so the first very first algorithm is what i had developed was called scf algorithm that is proposed su coordination with fairness what does it mean and what is the purpose of doing this so before we understand this algorithm we need to keep it in mind that what was the purpose of developing the algorithm purpose was very simple number 1 to understand uh, to estimate the channel characteristics or frequency band characteristics number 2 to estimate the number of secondary users number 3 to exploit the best channels so these are the three major goals we are having with these three goals in my mind we are starting working on this algorithm so now before i proceed with the uh, algorithm since it has been almost half an hour uh, is if there is any question uh, you can let me know or otherwise i will continue to that so am i audible by the way because continuously i am speaking i don't know whether am i audible yes sir yes sir you are audible okay. so if there is any question till now i can take it otherwise i will continue okay so if uh, there is no query uh, at the last i can take all the questions Oh, sir, now, there is one query in the chat box. Oh, just a minute, just a minute. Sorry. Uh, is there any sensors to sense the free channels and occupied sensors? Yes. So, see, uh, yes, there are sensors, and uh, okay. So, to answer it, there are. Uh, two ways right uh, one way will be clear with my this algorithm uh, so i we have two kind of setup in one setup i assume that yes we have sensors which will sense me sense it and give me the answer and other uh, uh, approach says that okay there is no sensor a uh, sensor and uh, still we can do it what is that technique that i will be going uh, i'm going to discuss in this slot someone has written energy detect as answer yes as i said there are several uh, uh, sensing techniques which we can use so that is one of the approach another approach if i don't use the sensors then how will i know so that is the second approach i am going to discuss now right okay so as i said that second user uh, scf algorithm so the goal number 1 is that channel characterization means to estimate the channel characteristics right so for that i use channel characterization phase i will explain it right now and with this phase guarantees correct estimation of mu that is the channel statistics with certain probability that is 1 minus delta and where delta is a very 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 small amount number another is one hat sensing phase where uh it will estimate the number of secondary users in the network and third orthogonal and block hopping approach where i will be estimating uh, sorry i will be exploiting the patient but 
uh, okay I, I will go in the details and then you will be able to understand and i will uh, answer your queries for sure in the next uh, one or two slides so let's come to the cc phase first that is channel characterization phase right so what is that so this cc phase guarantees correct estimation of mu with probability one minus delta where delta is very small so how does it estimate the channel statistics let's start uh, understand with this diagram right so uh, let's um, for better understanding uh, let me use the pen if i can and then i think i will be able to understand yeah, yes so um just a minute comment yeah so you can see in this diagram here we have uh, four users and four channels uh, I don't know if, yes, four users and four channels. So in the first time slot, oh, yes, so that is when I do it uh, full mode, I'm not able to use my pen. So, okay, let me try it. Okay, so in the first time slot, what you can see that all the users have selected the channels randomly. So that is why I say, okay, random hoping page. Means all the users select the channel randomly. That is what all the users have done. Now, what you can see in this first time slot, that secondary user one, three, and four, all three of them have used uh, selected the channel two only. So it means there will be collision on that channel. Thus, they have to select a new channel again. So that is why in second time slot, again, you can see that the secondary user one, two, three, and four have used a uh, selected a new channel randomly whereas secondary user 2 has selected channel 3 in the first time slot only and there was no collision so that is why it has started using the second approach that is called sequential hoping approach what the sequential uh, uh, hoping means that they will just start 3 4 1 2 3 4 1 2 1 3 4 4 1 2 3 4 like that and these other users will continue like that unless now you can see in the fifth time slot, all the users are on different channels. That is two, three, four, one. Means they have orthogonalized on different channels. From there, all the users have a started random home. Here only, it worth mentioning that why did we even go for the run, uh, sequential hoping? So for that, we need to estimate what is the goal of this phase, that is channel characterization phase that we have to learn the statistics and how are we going to learn the statistics using this formula mu n bar is equal to vn upon sn where vn is number of so sn is number of times a particular channel has been selected divided by number uh, and vn is out of that how many times it was found vacant so let's say i have selected the channel 3 80 times and out of that it has uh, sorry I have uh, selected it 100 times and out of that 100 times it is found free, it means 0 0.8 is the probability of that channel. Whereas if some user, uh, other channel has 0 0.2 probability, means that probability of vacancy of that particular user is less. Why did we use sequential hoping? The reason behind that is that I didn't want any collision to occur. Because if I could have continued with the random hoping, there was a large possibility that there could be have been the more and more collision. So now using this phase, we have estimated the channel characteristics. The very usual question starts, normal question starts over here, that how much time it takes for this random hoping and the sequential hoping. So this is the mathematics we have given that, okay, in this time slots with certain guarantee, the uh, estimation of the channel correct uh, statistics or characteristics will be correct and here only we are using reinforcement learning approaches now your uh, questions uh, answer to your query will come over here in that how to estimate the number of secondary users right so uh, purpose of this phase is correct estimation of u that is number of secondary users in the network with certain probability so secondary users can either be in sensing mode or sequential hoping mode. Now here only I will answer your queries is like this, that 
this is the approach where I am using, assuming that, okay, there are sensors. Oh, sorry. Okay, there are sensors. So, sorry. Yes. So, here what you can see, that secondary user 1 is continuously on channel 1 for 7 times, 8 time slots. And 1, when I am saying, I assume it is one of the uh, best channel, not on, one of the best, rather than best channel, which we have already estimated in the last phase, that is channel characterization phase. So, what other users are doing, other users are just uh, sequentially hoping. You can see secondary use this one three four one two three four one two like this. Secondary uh, this one four one two three four one two three. Similarly one two three four one two three. Now answer to your query comes is first approach. We assume that there is. Uh, we assume that there is sensor. Then my uh, task will be easier, and. Whenever some secondary user here, 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 it will cross or it will, uh, what you say, go on channel one, the secondary user one who is already sitting idle on that channel, if then it will sense that, okay, there is some movement on this channel. It means there are other users. So in this time slot, it will sense this user in this one, it will sense this user, it will sense this user. And the process repeats. At the last of it, you will, you will feel that, okay, other than me, there are three users. It means one plus three, four users are there in the network. So this was the answer that if I have sensors, let's say I don't have sensors and still I have to estimate the number of users. Then I will have to compromise and I will uh, what you say, except certain number of collisions. In that case, what will I do? That, okay, do one thing. It will keep transmitting on that channel. And obviously, when other users will transmit on that channel, there will be collision. And with counting that number of collisions, it will say that, okay, it means there is some use. So I hope I have successfully given answer to your query that, is there any sensor? Yes, there may be sensor or there may not be. In both the cases, estimate uh, the way of estimation of the number of secondary users will be different. So likewise, in this phase, at the end of this phase, all the secondary users will be estimating the number of secondary users correctly. So again, the mathematics that for how many times, uh, minimum number of times, we require to detect single user on optimal channel number one. Total, how much time will be taken? So that is the uh, uh, other problem. Thank you, sir. I think someone has unmuted by mistake. Please mute yourself. Yeah. Can someone mute him, please? Okay. So uh, this is how. And OBH uh, is the like. So now in OBH phase, what I will do, I will just, since now I have estimated the number of users as well as the number of, uh, as well as estimated the channel statistics. So I know that, okay, there are four users and these are the channel statistics. So I will estimate the, uh, I will select the or exploit the best channels always, right? So coming back to. There are some theorems. As I said, regret is one of the very important parameter. So that is why for regret, we have derived the relation as well as uh, the target was that number of collisions should be minimum. So that is why number of for number of collisions also we have derived the relation. Now, the second. So the, I wanted to take two uh, um, algorithms. One algorithm I have already uh, explained. Now we have met some kind of extension in that or changes in that where channel characterization is phase is same no problem where we have estimated the channel statistics but what we th thought that what is the final goal final goal is that the user should exploit the best channels that is the final goal then the question started do we need to have 
a separate OHS phase that was earlier in that algorithm to estimate the number of secondary users. Is it not possible that we can estimate, uh, sorry, we can exploit the best channels without estimating the number of users? And we answered it as yes, yes, we can do it. So that is why we came for this algorithm where we started with tracking phase. So let's come to the tracking phase. now. So this is a very simple diagram for the to understand the tracking phase. What is that? That the end, the end of channel characterization phase, all the four users were on four different channels, right? Now final goal is to estimate the uh, to exploit the best channels. And best channels means if there are four users, all four of them must be on the four four best channels. And whereas at the CC phase, end of CC phase, they are like this. So what should I do? So what we have started, okay, this user is already on secondary user, uh, uh, sorry, one. Now if what I do, oh, oh, sorry, if this secondary user who is at this place, if he uh, go upwards anyhow, then obviously this put, uh, a time will come then all the users will be like this. So what we say, that is why we named it tracking, up, tracking phase that it will track upwards. How come? So firstly, it will sense for some time this channel. Once it will feel that, okay, this channel is free. There is no primary user. Then it will shift over here. Then again, it will sip, sense the next be, uh, better channel. And it will sense, okay, this is also free. No problem. So it will shift over here so that is you can see that within 19 time slots this secondary user has moved from here to here similarly secondary user 3 after 61 time slot it will shift over here and this will shift over here so at the end of 156 time slots all the four users will settle in one of the best channels another example the worst case example was that what could happen that at the end of channel characterization phase, all the four users are in the four worst channels and now they have to move to the four best channels. Right. So from here to here, using this tracking approach within 156 time slot, they can easily travel. So in this algorithm, what we have shown that, okay, without having the need of any separate which is a uh, phase for estimating the number of second user still we can settle in the one of the best channels so again we did some analysis for that that how much time it will take for tracking it uh, towards the be better channel so that for that we start uh, got this ttr phase all the proofs for these algorithms and lemmas are there in the paper so if you want you can refer to them then uh, how many times a user should sense next better channel so that with certain guarantee it will say that okay that channel is free uh, uh, channel is free so for that nj is the time again we got the expected regret and number of secondary users collision relations so that was there in this one right so here was the results that uh, we compared it with cert, uh, some a state of the art algorithm and uh, our algorithm was with the black one you can see tsn algorithm and green one scf algorithm where we can see that this is the regret comparison and the this is the throughput comparison so regret of our algorithm has been almost uh, minimum out of them one reason uh, if i enlarge the size you can see that this pink one is even still doing better than us and the reason behind that is very simple that that was the state of the art algorithm considering that the number of secondary users in that case is known so obviously if they assume that it is known then they need not to spend time on estimating it rather than they can directly use it so that is why they are regretted somehow better than us then uh, for different setup uh, for n eight number of eight users and channels we have uh, derived this relation. This relation uh, plot is something special. What is special over here? Now you can see this TDN algorithm. Earlier I had TSN algorithm. So 
<laughs> here although i have not explained that theorem uh, or algorithm in details because of the time constants but i can give you a feel of that and what does it say basically that unless and until s stands for a static this s stands for a static in that algorithm and d stands for dynamic in that algorithm so what in tsn that is a static algorithm we assume that okay number of users in the network is static means once some users have entered the network they will be there in the network throughout but which is not a very practical assumption because you cannot have any control on the number of users on the users cognitive radio users or secondary users so in dynamic network what we said okay users can come at any time leave at any time or still our algorithm will work and that is what we have done and we have shown that from this dmc and dscf that was the state of the art algorithm this tdn algorithm was the best so now i have given you a sufficient idea of the algorithms then is the time to understand the hardware setup test bit so usrp is basically universal software radio peripherals it's a kind of software defined radio platform sdr platforms and uh, it's from uh, atas research ni is also national instrument is also one of the like uh, supplier for uh, that so you can see in this setup there are two usrps i have used usrp1 and 2 that are basically for the transmit one for transmitter and one for the receiver purposes at the transmitter size in one of the laptop you can see we have used the lab view environment whereas in the at the receiver side we have used the simulink environment so what we have done over there for this you can go in the details over here and let me tell about uh, it over here as well that uh, in the at the transmitter side we can also use gnu radio companion so we have uh, basically developed both the models using the lab view as well as gnu radio and the usrp boards we have used is x310 usrp boards and uh, ni from ni 2922 so we have sufficient number of uh, usrps available uh, with us at dtu as well so in future also if any one of you want to work on the hardware test bed most welcome in dtu we have sufficient number of usrps and we you can work with me uh, for this usrp test bed kind of right so let's uh, get some brief idea about this uh, uh, transmitter side so what is the goal of the transmitter that we have to create some traffic traffic in the real sense so and what's the purpose that using our algorithm we will see that whether we are able to estimate that traffic a statistics correctly or not so for that at transmitter side we are estimate uh, we are uh, what you say um, creating the traffic for that we have used the ofdm techniques and here you can see that 1024 uh, sub carriers we have used in that we have you also uh, given guard band and here basically we wanted to create eight channels eight bands so that is why you can see band 1 to band band at we have developed here uh, it are some inside block diagram of that labview uh, model All right so here you can see uh, that uh, p1 p2 p3 these are the different probability of the traffic that we have generated All right so here easily you can look at that 0.1 0.2 0.8 0.7 these all are the probability of vacancy of the channels bands and using our algorithms at the receiver side we will see that firstly our proposed algorithm can estimate this characteristics correctly or not this is the goal then at the receiver side you can see that uh, we have 
got the number of collisions, successful transmission, and we have used Simulink model for this and used different multi arm bandit algorithm that is Bayesian UCB, KL UCB, uh, all these algorithms we have used for that, right? So I cannot give you very details because it needs some like uh, time to spend on the hardware setup. Then only it will give you a better understanding. But yes, from here, just I have given you a glimpse of it that how SDR uh, receivers we have used, right? So this is these are again some glimpse of that, right? So now, till now, I was giving you a brief idea that how basically the reinforcement learning can be or multi arm bandit can be used in cognitive radio networks. Now, I will in next 10 minutes, I will be giving you a, like a feel that how the same learning algorithms can be utilized in the IOTs as well, IOT networks as well, right? So let's look at it. Again. So what exactly IOT is looks like that there are smart connected devices, some analytic IOT platform is there and the algorithm development. So I'm basically into this algorithm development side, uh, side where you can see that historical analysis we do based upon the history we learn and based upon that we want to optimize the throughput of the network right so what are the iot uh, iot challenges so that are like development development of algorithms then collection of enough data to build the algorithm then deployment of the algorithm to the cloud and then deployment of the algorithms on a smart device as well right so uh, let me introduce uh, the thing to speak over here. I think many of you already uh, must be aware of this. So how uh, the things uh, speak uh, works. So basically using this, we can deploy different algorithms to nodes and devices using MATLAB, right? And the basic purpose of this is uh, to collect enough data to build the algorithms which we want, right? So uh, Thing speak basically is a platform or web service, I should say, uh, from the MathWorks, which work basically for online data aggregation, right? So it allows us to collect, analyze, and act on the data from several things, which is a part of IoT, that is Internet of Things. Then once we have collected the data, it allows us, it can be used to analyze the data, right? So new MATLAB integration allows users to run scheduled MATLAB code on data coming into ThingSpeak, right? And once we can, um, what you say, aggregate and analyze the data, it can also be used to act on the data. Means, let's say, for example, we have taken over here that a tweet, a message should be tweeted when the temperature in the backyard reaches 32 degrees. So for such a thing, we can easily use this platform. So now coming to that's how this multi arm bandit learning can be used for Internet of Things networks, right? So here, now you can easily correlate with the IoT, uh, what you say, cognitive radio networks that we discussed for last 45, 50 minutes. Here, and uh, it was mentioning here only another types of network, although I'm not going into the details of that, but the Communication engineers who are working in this field, uh, some PhD students or master's student or other faculties as well. If someone is working in the reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, I don't know how many of you are aware, but this is one of the most recent technology which is supposed to be used, uh, uh, planned to be used in 6G, right? So what this reconfigurable intelligence surface is and which type of problem it deals with is very simple that nowadays line of sight problem comes, right? And especially the hilly areas, it is possible that where we have installed our towers, all the parts are not in the line of sight. Then how can we deal with it? Then reconfigurable intelligence surface comes into the picture. And what that surface uh, talks about, that basically that surface is made up of meta materials. That meta materials, uh, surface has different cells, different cells. Let's say, assume in one surface, there are 100 cells. 
So what exactly how does it work is that from transmitter, a signal will go fall on that met uh, what you say um, surface, and from there it can be reflected to the point where the line of sight communication was not possible. So that is a, the most simplest way how you can uh, think of the reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. And there, why did I mention that reconfigurable intelligent surfaces over here right now is that in that applications as well, easily this multi arm bandit or reinforcement learning can be used. Because, and how come, when I said there are such a large number of cells in that network, and obviously the SNR will be different for every cell or a part uh, of a uh, bunch of cells, then how a RL researcher like me can uh, utilize this RL algorithm in the understanding that, okay, let's uh, assume there are 100 cells and there are we have divided into a bunch of 10, 10 cells, uh, 10 such bunch of 10 cells each. Then which is the best cell? Why should I explore all 100 cells that which is going to give me the best reception of the cell? Rather than I will use multi-arm bandit or reinforcement learning algorithms to understand and to quickly learn that which bunch of the cells are good for us so that I can easily use that, right? So this is how that can be used there also. Now, coming back to the IoT networks, you can see there is a gateway. And uh, let me tell you, again, the hardware implementation of this paper is already there, so you can refer to that, right? So gateway is there. There's a large number of IoT devices you can see over here. Now, that our IoT network, that is, which is in the center, can be interfered by others as well. Which kind of interference is possible? Number one, that other IoT networks using the same IoT standard, creating interference in the same band. Whereas, other possibility is that other IoT networks using another IoT standard, creating interference in the same band. So they must might be using the same IoT standard or another. In that case, how to avoid this interference to maximize the throughput of the network? For that, again, we can use this algorithm and which we have, uh, you can see with the help of this one. That... Just I have to, yes I'm okay. right so here I have used USTS uniform so I know that you, many of you may not be aware but UCB is like that's called upper confidence bound algorithm so the person who has already working in RL uh, if you are aware of so UCB is one of the most classical uh, RL algorithm similarly TS Thompson sampling this is another uh, existing multi arm bandit algorithm, which can be used for quick learning. So you can see over here, uniform is kind of uh, 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 the UCB and Thompson sampling are performing much better than the uniform. one. Right. So here, how can, how we can use the reinforcement learning algorithms in the IoT networks. So question is, for what we use, so learning is here used to improve both the IoT network capability to support a large number of objects as well as the autonomy of the IoT devices. And intelligence object, intelligent objects can improve their access to the network by using low complexity and decentralized algorithms such as UCB and Thomson sampling. Right. So now the question is that let me conclude and then in next five ten minutes i will be discussing which is more important that about the future possibly work right so in today's talk for last one hour i have discussed the novel algorithms for opportunistic spectrum access in cognitive radio as well as iot networks right 
the proposed algorithm implemented using the matlab toolboxes you have uh, i have already shown you it has also been realized for validation of the proposed algorithm in the real radio environment using simulink as well as some other platforms right now the more interesting part over here right and here i have mentioned that's because why i have mentioned simulink and uh, matlab that this is i believe uh, the most frequently used platform we people use being from ec background or even computer background so that is why um, although it's not uh, compulsory that only matlab and simulink can be used rather than python and other uh, platform can all uh, languages can also be used right so let's uh, talk about some challenging problems design and implementation of the algorithms for the following scenarios starting with dynamic networks where secondary users can enter or exit the network at any time now you can think of that just few minutes back i discussed that my tdn that is uh, for dynamic network it was taking care of this scenario yes it's true that it was taking care of but the problem that is that we were using a epoch kind of concept where we used to reset the algorithm and again and again which was not a very efficient way we accept so that is why can we come up with some algorithm which we which need not to be reset again and again and without that we can come up with some different algorithm for dynamic scenarios number 2 where some secondary users are not faithful and may deviate from a given algorithm it's a wonderful open problem i can tell you and even i have worked up to a large extent in this but still a lot of problems are there what does it mean basically that there may be some jammers which will be deviating from your given algorithm jammers means which are not going to follow your algorithm so their target will be jam the signal whereas cognitive radio users are trying to access the channels then how will you differentiate between them how will you avoid those jammers and still you would like to improve the throughput of the networks so that is the another problem third problem adversarial networks where channel statistics are non stationary and where channel statistics are different for different users what does it mean again although i have bought but again a very non practical assumption we have assumed that channel is stationary this is not very practical how can a channel be stationary we don't have any control over the changing conditions of the channel and if we assume that ch condition channel conditions are changing then again the problem is that how will you learn the channel statistics again and again or so quickly that you can adapt to, to the changes in the channel conditions so that is another challenge fourth is where channel statistics are different for different second users right now we are assuming that okay the probability of vacancy of the channel is same for but it means we are assuming that the perfect sensing whatever we are uh, uh, sensing that is perfect number one number two that all second users are sensing in the same fashion what again it is beyond our control so how to come up with that scenario so that is another uh, research problem over there and obviously once you do it uh, design the algorithm unless and until test bed is not created for that algorithm it does not make a sense so again realization uh, of the test bed for validation of such algorithm in the real radio environment will again be a, another challenge coming to the last part of the um problems in iot networks to work in the distributed and multiplayer setup in iot which creates a new multi arm bandit game where all players do not face the same environment similar to the cognitive radio networks another challenge is to explore the following scenarios where there is a joint correlation between the channels yes channels may be correlated how will you deal with that channel conditions may be time varying what will you do with that when all nodes don't have data to send yes it is very practical that i when large number of iot devices are there all the iot devices may not have the data to send at all the time then how will you 
deal with that situation? How will your algorithm deal with that situation? This is another set of problems. And I last with the very interesting research problem that is analysis with the Thompson sampling. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but uh, people working in algorithms and especially RL algorithm may not may be aware of Thompson sampling. And it's well established fact that Thompson sampling performs much better than the classical UCB and other algorithm. But still, people don't use very frequently. And the reason are two reasons are twofold. Number one, that the theoretical analysis of Thompson sampling has not been easier so far. Hardly one or two people have worked on it, but still they have not been very successful in giving its theoretical proofs. And number two, the problem with the Thompson sampling is that it depends a lot on the distribution, reward distribution. As I said, it can be IID distribution, it can be Markovian distribution, it can be Gaussian distribution, it can be any other distribution. The test bed which we have created assume the UCB, classical UCB algorithm that don't depend on the distribution. Whereas if we uh, use the same approach for Thompson sampling, depending on the algorithm, we need to change the hardware setup again and again. So that is the different set, uh, uh, challenging problem, right? So these all are the challenges we are having an open research problem. So with this, uh, I will say thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your attention. In case, obviously, right now I will be taking questions from you, uh, you, and in future also, if you any uh, of you having any problem or any uh, issues to discuss, please feel free to contact through my email ID. And other than that, also, if someone is looking for PhD uh, or any uh, research collaboration, I'm most welcome. Uh, we can have a good collaboration in future as well, right? So thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Please, uh, I request uh, the session coordinator to uh, start the question and answer session if there is any. Uh, sir, uh, there is one question written in the chat yes, box. Uh, just, I'm coming to the, okay, yes, just I'm coming there. I'm coming there, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, is there any data set available? Uh, uh, do you think is there any need of uh, data set available for CR? For what purposes you are looking for the data set? Can you explain me? Then I will be uh, maybe able to answer it in details. For what purposes? Um, Uh, uh, sorry, I think she is not there who have asked the question. So maybe uh, she will contact me personally because uh, I cannot. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, please, please. Sir, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, sir, actually, I am doing PhD in wireless sensor network. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what is my doubt? Uh -huh. Actually, I I want to uh, jump into IoT. Yes, sir. So before jumping into IoT, so what must be the initial step? Uh, see, uh, you have uh, asked me a very broad question. When you say IoT, what I assume that there are different kind of uh, uh, work uh, possible in the IoT. But when you are uh, mm -hmm. asking me being a RL person, right? So uh, how I start with usually that firstly, we must be aware of uh, several some existing RL algorithms like as I said UCB that is upper confidence bound algorithm Thompson sampling and all and then uh, recently I can if you uh, drop me an email I can share you two three papers which are really focusing on the hardware setup of the IoT uh, network. Yes, right? sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I have different set of problems and that is so many wonderful extensions possible. My bachelor's and PhD students are already working on that. And uh, just if you want, uh, just you can drop me a mail and especially the hardware part. We have a lot, lot of the things to do rather than just the simulation part. Sir, 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 sir. Sir, another thing uh, like, uh, like NS2 and NS3 softwares. Yes. Um, so can we uh, use those things in uh, hardware implementation? Uh, 
uh see i typically use the uh, means either matlab or simlink even gnu uh, radio right so okay. uh, although uh, i came to know somewhere that ps nx3 uh, thing can be used but honestly saying that uh, i have never used so i cannot directly comment on that okay okay for for, for hardware implementation uh, yes i have seen uh, in your slide uh, yeah simlink software defined and, radio sdr uh, platforms uh, we use and with the help of that we can do that sir uh, are you working in wsn Uh, sensor network. Um, yes. Are when you, you say sensor network, what exactly is that? There are different uh, mm -hmm. several sensors in the uh, wireless network, right? Correct. So sir, correct. Uh, uh, IoT networks or the community radio networks and all they all are examples of that, right? So yes, sure. Right. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Sir, I will be in contact in. Um, sure. Please. You I, can I, drop I me a mail anytime. Most welcome. Sir, 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 sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir uh, i have a question sir yeah, uh, sir uh, actually uh, sir uh, i want to reduce the power consumption of a secondary user uh -huh. in cognitive radio networks so yes. sir uh, there is any data set uh, by using this we can apply in rl uh, for uh, reducing the uh, power consumption especially okay. sir in secondary users okay i will answer it in two manner number one when you say the power consumption my in case of my secondary user power is basically consumed in the case of uh, basically this collision whenever there are a large number of collisions power is being consumed right so as a algorithm designer we focus on reducing the number of collisions right so that and that is what you if you uh, have seen my results i have tried to minimize the number of collisions and it has been minimized up to a large extent in comparison to the state of the art algorithm number 2 when you talk about the uh, data set and all honestly saying uh, uh, this indu balla ma'am jo whoever you see and you are also asking about this, uh, this i cannot exactly correlate myself with that because what i can think of is that um, in rl i am searching from a scratch i no need uh, don't have any need of any such data set rather than i assume that i don't have any information available right and from there i would learn about the environment and then i have to reduce the, uh, the power consumption right okay so for that i cannot comment on this that is there any data set available because for last 6 7 years i have not come across any such data set okay all right and uh, sir uh, no. sir you uh, can you please suggest uh, means sir your graph in which software you have draw your graph yes, only in I, matlab yes all all are in the matlab only yes okay yeah thank you sir thank you okay any other query no ah uh, hello <laughs> yeah I don't think there is any other question. Sure, no problem. Uh, so, Akanksha, please continue. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank Rohit sir, who uh, for this informative lecture, we learned various important aspects of cognitive radio.